Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, this morning to our undergraduate research workshop. Uh, my name is Bruce Vandell, and I am uh, working with the University System of Georgia as a consultant, uh, supporting uh, the HIPS implementation teams. Uh, I'm guessing most of you who are on the call today are one of the team members from your respective institution, and we thank you for participating in today's workshop. Uh, today is the first in a series of workshops that we are hosting uh, with Leap State Georgia. Um, and I wanna thank Leap State Georgia for their efforts in helping us pull together and particularly Don Brown, who helped pull together today's webinar focus on undergraduate research. Denise, you could slip to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Bruce Vandell. Um, and uh, we of course will be working with you over the course of the next several months to provide support to you on a specific set of high impact practices and also your efforts to uh, incorporate high impact practices into your institution's implementation plans. And so to support that work, we have uh, coordinated and organized today's workshop and a series of workshops. If you could slip to the next slide, um, Denise, that we've scheduled over the next month or so. And so we look forward to you participating in those uh, uh, particular workshops that make uh, sense to you and are consistent with your institution's plans for implementing high impact practices today. Uh, so um, a couple of sort of logistical uh, housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, uh, first of all, uh, we're gonna, we ask that you keep uh, your microphones muted throughout the presentation uh, and session today, but do encourage your participation through the chat function. So feel free to offer comments and particularly questions for the panelists today uh, through the chat function. We will dedicate time at, after each of the presentations uh, to respond to your questions and uh, your comments. So I appreciate your participation and, and cooperation with this. I, I wanna thank uh, Robert Todd from the University System of Georgia and Denise Dumizi, uh, who also are supporting us today. You'll hear from Robert a little bit later on as we get into the Q&A section. And Denise is helping us today with managing uh, the, the Zoom. And so I wanna thank Denise for her time and effort as we uh, proceed through today's workshop. Without further ado, why don't we go uh, uh, introduce our panelists. I wanna say, first of all, that uh, this particular uh, workshop today uh, is uh, on undergraduate research. It's clearly the one um, uh, high impact practice that the institutions identified through their institutional surveys as of greatest interest. And so we appreciate uh, your commitment and interest in implementing undergraduate research. And we're fortunate today uh, to have institutional leaders that are doing outstanding work at their respective institutions uh, on implementing undergraduate research as part of their undergraduate programs. And so we're gonna hear presentations uh, from three institutions, University of North Georgia, Augusta University, and Columbus State University. Um, each will give us a presentation of about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and then we will, like I mentioned, uh, have time for questions at the end. So uh, our panelists include Dr. Anastasia Lin, who is the Assistant Vice President for Research and Engagement and the Director of the Center for Undergraduate Research and Creative Activities at the University of North Georgia. And Dr. Brian Dawson, Professor of Psychological Science, Principal Investigator for the McNair Scholars Program, Provost Fellow, and former Assistant Director of Center, the Center for Undergraduate Research and Scholarship also at North Georgia. Dr. Quentin Davis, Director of, Cent uh, of the Center for Undergraduate Research and Scholarship and the Director of QEP and Certification of Leadership Program at Augusta University. And Dr. Lauren King, Associate Professor of Biology, uh, Tower Day Coordinator, Honors, Fellow, uh, faculty, uh, Honors Fac faculty Fellow in, at Columbus State University. So once again, I wanna thank all of them uh, for agreeing to be today's presenters. And we're gonna go ahead and just get started uh, with Dr. Lynn and Dr. Dawson with the University of North Georgia. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks for having us today. Um, and I think we've hit everything on this first slide. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. 
So at the Center for Undergraduate Research and Creative Activities, which we call CURCA, we support undergraduate research and creative initiatives across all campuses. We see our office as sort of an incubator for undergraduate research ideas, which we hope then um, people who are participating with our department go and implement within their own departments. So we provide workshops and information. A lot of times these are targeted towards students. Um, our office is a, is a little bit more targeted towards students, I would say, because we're trying to get our students really interested in undergraduate research. But we do provide a lot of funding for students as well as for faculty to help them get undergraduate research ideas off the ground. Um, we also provide a couple of other things. Um, we have conferences that we run. Um, our annual research conference is actually happening right now. So I'll do the presentation and then I'll leave Dr. Dawson to answer questions while I go back to it. We do have a journal as well that we support students through. Um, but one of the most unique things I think about our undergraduate research office is we partner with the Nationally Competitive Scholarships Office. I actually oversee both offices. And so the idea is not only are we an incubator of excellence for undergraduate research, but we are encouraging our students to become complete student scholars who are not only engaging at undergraduate research here at the university, but they're looking for ways beyond our university to engage. Next slide, please. So I start off all of our presentations with sort of a centering definition of what is undergraduate research. Um, and here at the University of North Georgia, this is the definition we've used for the past seven years or so. It's an inquiry or investigation conducted by an undergraduate student that makes an original intellectual or creative contribution to the discipline. We like to emphasize that we are all disciplines. We know that sometimes when students hear undergraduate research, they just think STEM. Um, that is, is not true. That's definitely not the case here at UNG. And so we like to emphasize the different ways that you might engage in undergraduate research and to make them aware that it does happen across the disciplines. So in the photos that you see here, these are all students and faculty who have been funded by our department. Um, and you see they're doing just a lot of different types of exciting work. Um, one of my favorite projects is that one in the middle. This was a group of artists who were commissioned to uh, create some artwork, both sculptures and paintings for our biology building. And they partnered with um, a group in Gainesville that focuses on researching turtles. They made these amazing turtles. Um, and so it was a really, really neat project that brought a lot of beauty and artwork to that campus. Um, but again, it's something that some people might not think of as undergraduate research. Next slide, please. So, Typically, when we do these sorts of presentations, we also include, include the why. Um, I think talking to you all, you already know the why. Why do we do the high impact practice of undergraduate research? Well, we know from the literature that it enhances student learning and critical thinking skills. It provides better problem solving skills. It increases retention um, and increases enrollment in graduate school. And again, here at UNG, since we do partner with my other office, Nationally Competitive Scholarships, we also see that our undergraduate researchers are our best applicants for those scholarship opportunities and for things like research experiences for undergraduates. So um, I know I went through that quickly, but I think this is a very friendly crowd already to hit practices. So next slide, please. Okay, I'd like to go in depth a little bit on some of the opportunities that we do. And then Dr. Dawson will talk about a couple that he oversees. So first, one of the newer opportunities we have are student faculty collaborative mini grants. These are small pots of money that we award to student faculty teams who are applying to conduct research. Uh, this year we've swapped it so that the student actually leads the writing of the grant itself. This emphasizes students in the research initiative and it also helps them get a little bit of practice in grant writing and critical thinking. So each of the students collaborates with a mentor or mentors in order to put together a project. And most of the time the project is an extension of something the faculty member is probably already doing, but then they apply for that funding. So the student has a great opportunity to kind of practice all parts of what it means to professionalize within undergraduate research. Um, and then the student completes the research over the course of the semester with that funding. Next slide, please. This is our signature program that we have in Kirka, the FUSE program the Faculty Undergraduate Summer Engagement Program. This program is pretty amazing. Dr. Dawson and I have both um, taken part in it before we were in the office. Uh, with this program, we pay faculty mentors to work specifically with a student researcher for eight weeks in the summer. We call it an internal REU. Um, so it's an opportunity for students and faculty to really engage in research in a very in-depth way. 
The students also go through a series of workshops with us where they develop research and presentation skills and they further grow their knowledge. Again, this is what I think of as an incubator. Most of our FUSE programs, um, they are sort of trying out a research project they might want to do in the classroom later on. In fact, our selection process prioritizes projects that are going to lead to long-term undergraduate research projects. So we're hoping that a faculty use this as kind of a launching pad for their own research. And in fact, one of the two faculty you see there, um, she has actually done this. She's taking a lot of the research that they've done in the summer and incorporated it into her research lab, the scale lab, to great success. She's actually had two students, two undergraduates, win the NSF GRFP, which is 130,000 for students to persist on in a graduate program. So again, we see these programs as sort of incubators for our faculty to, to take what they're doing. We're incentivizing it through giving them money and then they take what they're doing with us and they apply it in their classrooms later on. Next slide, please. Another way we try to kind of complete the circle and provide plenty of support for our students is we know that undergraduate research doesn't stop. Well, it almost never stops, right? We always keep pushing our projects and we keep finding new questions, but at some point we do want our students to present them and to have the opportunity to practice. So we also have student travel grants that support students in going to external conferences to present their research. Again, this is competitive funding, so our students are also practicing grant writing. Um, and as we all know, going to a conference allows us to gain new perspectives on our research and it allows our students to professionalize. It also allows them to network beyond the university. Next slide, please. We also have a handful of on-campus presentation opportunities. Our, our annual research conference, as I mentioned, is going on today. It's not in our convocation center as it has been, as you see in the picture there, it's online on Zoom, but we have about a, 120 students who signed up to uh, either present or come and listen to presentations. And this past year, we had our first annual research pitch modeled after the three minute thesis. So again, just another opportunity for students to practice delivering their research in a professional format. With the research pitch, we really like uh, trying that out this past year because we realized it allows students to practice that elevator pitch that can be really important as they transition away from undergrad into either grad school or to professional opportunities. Next slide. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Dawson to talk about the McNair program. Thank you, Dr. Owen. Um, so yeah, we've uh, been fortunate enough to have the uh, McNair Scholars Program at our university for the past uh, four years. And so each year we serve a cohort model of 25 first-generation low-income students and um, underserved uh, minority students. And so uh, one of the things that, that our program does is that these students come to us usually in their sophomore or their junior year, and they're uh, quickly paired with a faculty mentor. And all our students are all um, required to complete an undergraduate thesis. And so they work with their faculty mentors many times as an extension of many of the projects that Dr. Lynn just mentioned uh, to create their own unique uh, research project. And so we continue to help uh, support those students um, by providing different resources, different materials, different uh, equipment that they might need uh, to, to complete those research projects. And then to also help them present that uh, information through a separate set of funds for travel and, and other conferences that they can actually attend to as well. And so we're, we're very proud to, to say that 100% of the students that are part of our McNair Scholars projects, they complete and they present their research um, at the local or the regional, in some cases, the national level. Um, and the, the program itself, uh, just to kind of like, you know, to, to let you know, has been very, very um, uh, productive in getting our students into and accepted into fully funded graduate programs. I mean, as Dr. Lynn mentioned before, uh, many times when we think of undergraduate research, we think of just those STEM related fields. However, we've had students from music, we've had students from psychology, English, Spanish, um, and education as, as well. Um, and one of our students uh, here as well, uh, just graduated recently, has just gotten into, um, uh, this is Maddie, uh, has just gotten into the uh, UGA school, uh, uh, school counseling program and is fully, fully funded uh, in her work. Uh, next slide, please. Um, some of the other efforts that we're working on um, are our hip coding efforts. Um, as many of you are probably aware, uh, coding for several different um, uh, high impact practices, one of which is undergraduate research. And so we have used our book adoption process because it's a point of contact in which um, all, all of our faculty uh, touch. Um, 
And we ask our faculty as they're adopting their textbooks to also identify for their course for the upcoming semester, um, if it does um, lean on one of the four identified HIPs being service learning, undergraduate research, uh, workplace learning and the capstone projects. And so we, each of these has uh, four codes that gives a different level of the uh, amount of uh, work or hours of service that a student might engage in in those, those processes. And so we take that information and we um, put that into our, our banner attribute system. And so it's very forward facing for our students. So as they're um, looking towards these classes in the, the, the upcoming semester, they can see exactly uh, which courses do provide them with different high impact practices um, and the, the amount of work that will be required for those practices. Uh, in addition to this, uh, we've recently been able to pull all this information together um, and make it searchable by faculty. So faculty can quickly find in our repository system all of the other courses that are similar to theirs that might engage in service learning or in undergraduate research. And so they can reach out to other faculty within their department and outside of their department um, to start collaborating as well. Um, one of the projects that we're just starting uh, this semester is taking that same information and identifying um, in our core curriculum as well as other programs where these HIPs are, are present so that we can make this information more available and readily accessible to our students. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, one of the other unique aspects of where undergraduate research is situated at our university is that um, the sister office is the Nationally Competitive Scholarships Office. And I wanted to briefly touch on it because I think it, it shows how marrying the two offices can really help stretch how you're encouraging students to engage in undergraduate research. So we expand the support of Kirka by mentoring student applicants for nationally competitive funding. Um, one of the big ones that we see a lot of crossover from Kirka into national scholarships are REUs, um, those external research experiences for undergraduates for students. Uh, are paid to do research at an external university for the summer. And um, we've seen a lot of success with that. And our students come back from those programs really engaged and eager to uh, not only continue undergraduate research here at the university with our professors, but they're also really, really excited about research and they start sort of disseminating that information to other students. So we have a lot of them do presentations, um, they become our Kirka ambassadors, they end up going to every conference, every, everything that we have, and it sort of rejuvenates them in this idea of undergraduate research because they're seeing how far it can take them. Um, and then of course there are other great opportunities that are nationally funded, things like study abroad, where some students are going to do research, graduate school funding, and even things like the Fulbright that pay for students to do research abroad. Next slide. So I thought we would spotlight one student um, who has kind of done everything that we, we hope our students do. Uh, this is Caroline Brown. She was in our honors program here. She participated in the FUSE program that I spoke about that summer research program. Um, and then she earned the Goldwater Honorable Mention. As many of you know, that is one of the that is actually the top undergraduate research award in STEM. Um, and she was a little bit disheartened that she you know, wasn't a winner, but she kept it in stride and she kept moving. She earned an REU to work in a chemistry lab at the University of Minnesota and came back just super excited and engaged about all the research and all the, the excitement that she'd had at that lab. And she was then invited to present at Rice University. And this was a, a funny story. She got the call and she said, well, I've you know, I don't have any funding to go to Rice. And they said, no, we wanna fly you out there. We're gonna pay you to go. So it was like all of these things were kind of coming together for her. And then finally, uh, she was accepted at Yale into their PhD program in chemistry. Um, and then she earned an NSF award to actually fund it. So um, we like to show students like this, and she's you know, not the only story like that, but it kind of shows how this trajectory of, of students engaging in undergraduate research through our offices kind of moves them towards their future goals. Next slide. These are just some numbers um, of the different undergraduate research funding that we've done through our office, some scholarship snapshots. Um, we're just very proud of what our students are doing and how all these programs sort of play into the next one, including McNair. And we're hoping that the HIP coding efforts help us to further move these things along. Um, and next slide. I think I have one more, and I think it's just a bunch of happy faces because we like to show uh, what amazing things our students are doing. So thank you all very, very much. Um, I'm going to hop off to go back to our research conference, but Dr. Dawson will hang on the call if there are any questions later on. Thank you. A great conference. 
And I forgot, I, I need to pass this off to our next presenters who are at Augusta. Sorry, Quentin, go right ahead. All right, thank you, Dr. Lynn. That was great. And I think you're gonna hear a lot of the same types of things from me. So that's exciting to see that we're doing a lot of similar um, programming. So again, my name is Quentin Davis. I'm at the uh, Center for Undergraduate Research and Scholarship at Augusta University. And um, let next slide, please. I'm going to tell you a little bit about where we um, where we've been, how we got where we are, and kind of where we're going today. So our mission is to support undergraduates in the pursuit of discovering new information, investigating factors of influence, and innovating original work under the collaborative guidance of a faculty mentor. And our vision is to make collaborative research and scholarly activity a characteristic feature of the undergraduate culture for all of our students at AU, regardless of their identity or their major. And we strive to develop students' love of discovery and readiness to contribute to a productive and ethical society through high impact learning. Um, so this mission and vision statement um, statements were developed in the last few years, and they've really helped us to guide where we want to put our energies and our funding. And so that was a big part of um, growing our program. Next slide, please. We uh, began in 2007 as a team that was submitted or asked to go to a Kerr Institutionalizing Undergraduate Research Workshop, which is a several day research workshop, which I highly recommend. Um, this was the, the idea of one of our deans at the time of the College of Science and Math, and um, excuse me, Science, Math, and, and Humanities at the time at Augusta State University. And at that point, we built a two-year, a five-year, and a 10-year plan, which we've been kind of adding on to sometimes more intentionally than others over the years. Um, after a few years, we were recognized by the university as a committee, um, a formal committee in the university. And soon after that, we were converted to a center. Um, in 2013, we had our first hire as a, a, of a coordinator, a full-time coordinator. And then in 2019, I was hired as the first full-time director. And I'll tell you a little bit more about our structure in a minute. But, but those um, resources from the university, having that support to have several full-time positions has has really helped us expand where we want to go. Next slide, please. Our services kind of fall into one of these buckets, and this is definitely not, they are not mutually exclusive buckets, but our primary job is, is um, matching students and faculty mentors. Almost everything we support is under the guidance of a faculty mentor, uh, whether that's through a thesis program or through independent research um, and, and various labs across the campuses and students, whether they are getting credit for this or perhaps they are simply volunteering. But that matching piece is, is the primary um, service that I think that we provide to our campus. We also provide financial support similar to UNG. We have um, grants that support supplies and grants that support travel. Um, for our students and our faculty that are working with the undergraduates. We try to recognize our students and mentors in several ways throughout the year. I'll talk about that a little more and help them disseminate their work on campus and off campus and written work and oral work and so forth. And then we also provide professional development for our students. I'll note that at the top of the screen, you see a little um, green leaf. So throughout this presentation, I've just put that little symbol there so that you know these are areas that we are trying to grow <laughs> right now. So some of these things we've been doing for a while and some of these things are brand new. So I'll try to um, highlight those as we move on today. Next slide, please. Our structure is such that we are in the Division for Instruction and Innovation. Um, so we, I report to the Vice Provost for Instruction and we are in collaboration very much so with the study abroad director, the honors program director, and others that support student-facing services like the Career Center, um, the Academic Success Center, libraries, and so forth. I mentioned earlier that we have a full-time director, a full-time coordinator. We have nine uh, 
people in our faculty advisor, the faculty advisory committee, excuse me, two student assistants that are part time, and seven student ambassadors. Next slide, please. Our advisory committee um, is made up of faculty who primarily have done research with students, so they understand what it's like to be a faculty member teaching, um, how that works into promotion and tenure, um, all those different pieces that contribute to understanding how um, undergraduate research works in the faculty members um, world. They review our grant applications, they review our summer scholars applications, they advise on the website and on procedures and a variety of things. And so we really come together only as needed, um, which I think makes them happy so that this is not necessarily a monthly meeting that they have to go to. Next slide, please. Our student ambassadors are um, selected by the CUR staff, meaning me and the, and the coordinator. They write an essay about why they think they would be a good um, fit for CURS. Oftentimes they have already been funded or been a um, participant in the Summer Scholars Program themselves, but that's not required. After we select those students at the beginning of the year, we do a kickoff with them give them an orientation and talking points and have some of the expectations for the year. They work a certain number of events throughout the year, including our undergraduate research and fine arts conference, um, the student research series, and really they are the best advocates for us really. The students love to hear from other students about their experiences, their challenges, and, um, and get some advice from them. So they all uh, welcome emails at any time from other students who are just getting started. Next slide, please. We facilitate matches between our faculty and our students in several ways, but the, the most common way is honestly just the good old fashioned one on one conversations um, by phone or over email. So faculty members often reach out to us to say, hey, I'm, I have a new grant. I'm looking for some students to work on that. Um, and then we also have students who come and say, hey, my roommate is doing this. I'm interested. How do I get started? And our coordinator does a great deal of one-on-one -on -one, um, kind of digging to find out what the, what the requirements are, what the eligibility is, um, and, and what the students' needs are, what their career interests are. And so those conversations are, are priceless, really. That allows us to get very good matches made between our students and faculty members. Once we do that advising though, we kind of hand the process off to the faculty members. So we encourage students to write a very professional email and we give them guidance on what that email needs to include, what they need to bring on an interview for a research position. Um, and, and then the faculty member makes the decision of who works with them. So we, we don't make any decisions about that. We also have a 24 seven a research portal on our website where faculty can submit essentially an information card and we put that in so that students can browse um, what projects are available at any given time. And this really changes. It's, it's certainly not an exhaustive, but it does change. We try to update it every year or two. Next slide, please. We also facilitate matches in person and in and, and larger groups, at least not in COVID time. Um, we bring students to tours. So uh, some of the photos that you see here on the left are students taking a tour of the Georgia um, research, cancer research um, facility. And then on the right, we have ice cream socials. We have more formal meet and greets. And so the ice cream socials and those types of things we might run at the beginning of a year to say, welcome back. And it's a great way for students just to um, network and other students to learn about that. Ice cream or treats of any kind tend to pull the students in, but the faculty enjoy coming and meeting new students as well. Um, the bottom right photo that you see here is from one of our more formal events, a meet and greet on our health sciences campus where we invited about 15 professors to give a just a couple minute summary of what their research was about. Again, we provide food and a venue, a place for people to mingle and talk and students can then introduce themselves and learn a little bit more about the opportunities on campus. Next slide, please. Other places that we, we try to take advantage of any place we can in terms of showing up on campus. So 
In the top right corner, you see a bunch of our students are presenting their summer scholars research at the freshman convocation. So on day one for our freshmen, they get to see students who have been engaged in research at least for a summer and sometimes more like a year or two. And they can welcome the brand new freshmen to campus and let them know what some of those opportunities are going to be for them down the road. We have um, preview days, of course, and any, any orientations like that that we have for faculty or students really we try to show up and have our ambassadors there to answer questions. Our undergraduate research fair is held every fall. We tend to have a faculty panel so that students can ask questions and see what expectations are. It uh, breaks down a lot of the um, intimidation that students often feel when they're trying to get involved in research. We make sure that we have uh, faculty from especially the humanities. So I um, just like Dr. Lynn was saying, we have a lot of people who think that research is only for uh, the STEM sciences. So when students get to see like, well, what are you doing in political science? What would you, uh, what kind of research happens in history? And it's much easier for them to visualize how they can get involved. We also have a student panel to talk about time management. And um, again, it's a little more casual. They can ask any question they want to. And sometimes we leave the room so that they don't, they don't feel like they have to answer in a particular way. Our part of our undergraduate research fair is also um, having students be able to express their research in a more creative way. So we did sidewalk um, chalk and let them um, just come and do that a few days before the research fair. Next slide, please. Our summer scholars program, similar to UNG, of course, is um, a, we have a nine week or a five week program that faculty can participate in. We've kind of landed on that after going back and forth a few different years. Our program tends to have around 40 students each summer and around 20-ish faculty. Um, we have also changed over time so that we used to have our faculty and students all apply at the same time. Um, that didn't seem to work so well. So now we have our faculty apply in about December and put their, propose, put their proposals in. Those proposals that are accepted, we then list on the student application and the students can rank which program they are interested in. Um, around that's, that happens in January and February. Around March right now, we are matching students with faculty. And again, the faculty have the final say of which students will be working with them for the summer. But a lot of times they haven't, especially if they do not teach in an undergraduate college, um, they may not know any students. So we really try to help them um, get students that are engaged and, and eager to work in their field. The students are hired as employees, which has some pros and cons to it. Um, they work about 20 hours a week and they receive a uh, you know, stipend for that. And the faculty also, as long as they are not 12 month faculty, they receive a stipend. Throughout the summer, we provide professional development workshops um, on ethics and research and ways to get them thinking on teamwork and leadership, um, the elevator pitch and that kind of thing. So lots of the same things um, that are happening at North Georgia, we're doing as well. Um, and sometimes those seep over into the academic year, sometimes they don't. Next slide, please. I, I failed to mention we have a symposium at the end of the Summer Scholars Program. So there's a fairly formal symposium. Uh, last year, of course, um, we had that virtually. We hope to go back in person now. And the Student Research Series is our longest standing program. So we began this in the year after we went to that um, FER conference. So this is at least 10 years old. Um, so student monthly, on a monthly basis, uh, I believe it's the fourth Fridays of every month at one. We invite two speakers or two talks, I should say. Sometimes there are students that, um, that present together, of course. And so they present in a um, social setting. It's a fairly formal setting. So it's an oral, about 20 minute presentation with time for Q&A between. And then a lot of times what we do is we tack on a tour after that student research series. So the, um, while we have a captive audience, we'll try to um, schedule also a, a tour. In this case, you see an Instagram post for the art and design tour that followed the student research series that day. 
Next slide, please. One thing that we began this year was really a function of the um, workshops that I mentioned that we do in the summer program. We decided to extend that into the full academic year. So we now have monthly, we call it the Researcher Toolkit Series. And um, of course, this year has been all on, uh, has been all virtual, but students come and learn about um, whatever topic it is that we have selected for that day, whether it's presenting and how to design a poster, um, how to explain your research in a very short amount of time, um, presentations, funding opportunities, publication opportunities. So we try to change up the, um, the tools that they have. Next slide, please. And then we encourage students to disseminate um, anywhere that they can. We try to take advantage again of any opportunities on campus. These are fairly easy but less formal, a little more casual. So whether it's the new student convocation or student clubs, um, preview days, the provost kickoff for the faculty members, we uh, find that faculty really enjoy um, getting a, that up from students at the beginning of the year to see what they've been doing all summer. And then we also go into the communities, uh, high schools or the prep center or TechNet Augusta, those types of things and give the students again a, a chance to practice their oral skills, their presentation skills, so that when they are presenting at those national or um, lo regional and local conferences that they've, they've really gotten their, their um, presentation down. Next slide, please. We also have an undergraduate research journal called The Arsenal. This was begun by undergraduate students here and um, some faculty advisors. We currently have an editorial board that um, it consists of her staff and librarians and a faculty representative. Um, and then we also have student reviewers and faculty reviewers. This is one area that we have not um, spent as much energy on and really wanna um, be able to expand this. We don't get the number of submissions that we would like and so, um, increasing the PR for this and trying to find out what those barriers are to students um, submitting um, manuscripts for this journal is one of the goals that we have for the, for the coming year. Next slide, please. Many of you are probably aware of posters at the Capitol, the Georgia Undergraduate Research Conference, NPER, things like this that allow students to not have to travel very far, but um, we certainly support them and um, with small grants and sometimes taking a van over to these, um, these events if they're close by. We're also getting into the um, competitions that Dr. Lynn mentioned. This is fairly new for us, but we uh, had our first um, participants in the Inventure Prize at Georgia Tech just a couple of years ago. Next slide, please. We communicate, you know, communication is of course, primary, that's what we need to do to get uh, information out, get students um, trying something new. And so we do that in the expected ways. We have a monthly newsletter where we highlight students, sometimes we highlight faculty. We can um, send our congratulations out to grant recipients and summer scholars recipients and those types of things. Um, we do surveys via our Instagram or our, our tabling options to find out what students want to hear about. Um, we have a newly re redesigned website as well that really lets students and faculty know more of the services that we provide. Okay, next slide, please. Our recognition of students and mentors is really important. Um, when I came on full-time, we didn't have um, a, a formal way to recognize our mentors. And so we established two different um, programs. One is the High Five My Faculty Award. Both of these are student nominated, by the way. The High Five My Faculty Award is not competitive. And there's no limit to the number that we um, hand out each year. Um, so this is where a student will submit a nomination for their faculty explaining why that faculty deserves a high five. We then surprise the, student, the faculty member in class um, after we've coordinated, hopefully with their chair and or their dean and the student that nominated them to surprise the faculty member in class and just say, you know, great job. We appreciate all the time and effort 
And then that also is a great recruiting tool for us because all the students in that class can um, kind of see that, that that faculty member is going above and beyond what they have to do in class. Um, the mentor excellence, oh, let's go back just one. Um, we also have a mentor excellence award that was begun um, last year, or I guess two years ago, lost that COVID year. Um, this is student nominated, but it is competitive. So we only get one of these a year. And the, um, the person who received the mentor of excellence award also receives a $500 grant toward work with an undergraduate researcher. Um, next week is our undergraduate research week. And so we'll be celebrating and announcing the recipient of the Mentor Excellence Award at our virtual happy hour, um, which is in place of our usual kind of wine and cheese event at the, um, at the, toward the end of the year. All right, next slide, please. A couple other things that we have added this um, term. So we have not actually um, awarded any academic distinctions yet. We'll do that for the first time this May. We're excited for that. We have a distinction of, in research and a distinction of excellence in research where students have to um, meet certain criteria, certain GPA, certain number of hours in research and presentations, and then they are awarded a medal and or a cord for graduation. We also have instituted three new competitive fellowships this semester. Um, we were not able to give um, the international researcher one since no one is traveling right now but we did award our first community impact fellowship to a student and, a, and also another one for the fellowship for enhancing equity and diversity. So we're very excited to expand um, support for those students. Next slide, please. Where we're going in the future is really that um, to learn more from other people around the country like this kind of setting, um, I'll be serving on the Division for Undergraduate Research Programs as a Kerr Council beginning this summer. I'm excited to kind of serve with those people and learn more about um, the, the governing board of Kerr and other um, initiatives going on at the national level. Next slide, please. And lastly, um, the things that we have coming up that um, you know, are also in our very near future or hopefully in the next couple of years. This summer we'll be building a, we are building a graduate bridge program and this program is to serve students who are recent bachelor's degree um, recipients, they're graduates, and they're going into one of our graduate programs, but they don't, they're not enrolled, they're not an A student um, in that summer between programs. And so this is uh, made to address that gap and give them some opportunity to um, have funding while they engage in research. They don't, um, they don't begin any curriculum for their graduate program, but they will be funded um, to go ahead and get involved in the research of their graduate program. We're looking at for ways to improve our measurement. Oh, sorry, one more. Uh, we're looking for ways to improve our measurement of publications and presentations um, by students, whether that's in digital measures or some other um, area. And we're also looking to partner with many um, well, we, we have partnered with several different people on campus who are looking for NIH or APA, NSF grants, uh, who want to tack on to our summer scholars program and trying to figure out how we can do that best and adding clinical research assistance since we are a um, such a medical hub. There's a lot of clinical trials that students can learn from. Next slide, please. And lastly, just our, our partners on campus. Um, our, our successes, I believe, are due to these partnerships and how we work together with these different offices on campus, whether it's sponsored programs or deans or student life and engagement. We have a lot of um, really good uh, ideas and brainstorming sessions that allow us to grow and see areas where there are gaps. And I will finish there. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And I'll take questions later on. For now, I'm gonna kick it off to Dr. King um, from Columbus State. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Davis. Um, all right, so I get to go last. Um, and I will say that I'm coming at this from a slightly different perspective um, because CSU is a slightly different institution. Um, we 
don't have as of yet an undergraduate research center or anything like that. Um, but I've been taking furious notes and this has been really great for ideas and things that I can pitch um, to our provost to hopefully advocate for these things on campus. Um, I will say, so I came at this from the perspective of a faculty member that was already really, really involved in undergraduate research. Um, so I am faculty in the biology department here at CSU. Uh, I've been very active in both undergraduate research as well as graduate research. Um, and then, and, and for a number of years, I've also been the faculty mentor for our undergraduate research journal Momentum, um, which I'll mention a little bit later. And then in the spring of 2019, I got uh, chosen as the coordinator of Tower Day, uh, which is our undergraduate research conference here at CSU. Uh, and have since spent a lot of time kind of envisioning what it could be. Um, and that extends into what undergraduate research on our campus can be uh, going forward. So we can move to the next slide. Um, so for context, which I think is really important, um, CSU is an open access institution for students who live within a 50 mile radius of our campus. It is primarily undergrads. So we have about 8,400 students overall across two campuses, um, 6,800 undergrads. 60% uh, of those are female. These are stats from 2020. So 60% female, 49.5% non-Caucasian, 31% first generation students, uh, and 47% of our undergrads are Pell Grant recipients. And so we have a diverse student population and one that is going to have special needs um, and special ways that we can support them. So our institutional strategic plan um, aims to serve this population with high impact practices, inspired largely by the Liberal Education and America's Promise Initiative of the AACNU. Um, and this encompasses a lot of different areas. So we're talking about undergraduate research today, um, but we also really, really advocate for first year experiences, international education, and servant leadership, um, as well as many other HIPs. And a lot of these are interwoven with one another at our institution as well. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so how do we define undergraduate research? I will say uh, coming at this from a STEM perspective. So um, I'm a microbiologist, that's my training. I'm a lab scientist. And so I'm very familiar with the ins and outs of STEM research how it deals with undergraduates, what that looks like as far as presentation, dissemination, mentorship, all of those things. Um, but part of the challenge for me coming into this role of really pulling together all different types of undergraduate research across our university uh, was understanding what that looks like in other disciplines as well. Um, and so the first thing was we want to talk about undergraduate research, but we also want to include scholarly creative endeavors. Um, we have really, really amazing creative works that are happening. Um, but one of the challenges we had had with Tower Day was that our participation was almost entirely from STEM. Um, we had a lot of biologists and chemists and nursing school students. Um, however, you know, we have a phenomenal music school. Nobody was submitting for Tower Day. Um, so none of representation from these other types of scholarly activities. And so we expand our definition and say, um, how do we define undergraduate research? We say that it's grounded in academic analysis. It builds upon current knowledge in our society. Um, it doesn't have to be groundbreaking. Uh, within the context that we are, we're a you know, small to medium undergraduate institution. Funding is always tight. Facilities are always tight. And so um, we find our little niche within what that can be here at CSU. Um, so we that may be needed in essential replication of studies, um, synthesized prior knowledge that examines the state of a field, or new work inspired by known experts. Yes, next slide. For our goals, um, kind of similar, this is you know stuff that you've heard before. We are all very familiar with undergraduate research as a high impact practice. Um, however, I'll point out, um, 
once again, one of the things that brought me to this was really looking at STEM fields and underrepresented groups within STEM fields and saying, okay, we have a huge problem in biology, for example, with retention and progression and students who sign up to be a biology major and then change majors or worse yet, um, end up not completing their degree at all. And so one of our um, kind of initiatives has been, how do we support those students, especially those underrepresented, you know, first generation, um, all of those students that may need a little more support. And one of those ways is by utilizing high impact practices like undergraduate research. So we wanna help students acquire these high level critical thinking skills, communication skills, data analysis skills, um, prepare them for application to graduate school and their future careers, and really demonstrate to those future employers and graduate schools that they can think critically, that they can complete independent work under appropriate mentorship. Um, and this really makes them competitive once they leave CSU. Next slide. Um, as far as funding available, this is one of our challenges, I will say, uh, as a faculty member who does research with students and as a lab scientist, so that research is not cheap. Um, we do have some intramural funding opportunities available. So specifically, we have uh, student research and creative endeavors grants. These are generally around $300 grants that are competitive. Um, however, we have a good amount of funding set aside for this. So students apply for these these, and they can apply for these grants to fund their actual research um, or travel grants also. Uh, we also have faculty development grants through the provost office. And so I will say personally, a lot of my research with undergraduates has been funded through these university grants available to faculty. Um, and then of course, we have extramural grants as well that we go out for. Next slide. <laughs> All right, so what I did uh, for this was I said, okay, I know what undergraduate research looks like for me, um, but I reached out to other units within the university, other disciplines to see what it looks like for them. So first, um, what I'm familiar with, uh, I'm in the biology department, I've been here since 2014. Uh, we actually have undergraduate research as part of the curriculum to get a BS in biology. And so as students approach their last few semesters, um, this is ideally a three semester sequence. So in the first semester, they write a proposal. Uh, this is all in collaboration with a faculty mentor. So they write a proposal. In the second semester course, they actually conduct the research um, collect all their data, analyze, et cetera. And then in the third semester, they write a thesis and present in an oral presentation to the department and the university at large. Um, so this is one way that students can fulfill this requirement to get their BS in biology. Uh, we now have other options for them as far as they could do an internship for this as well, but really emphasizing this hands-on sort of interactive um, means of doing science. We also within our department um, embed research into all of our classes that are 3000 level um, and above. And so this starts with cell genetics, um, that kind of thing. And then especially once we get up to our senior electives, our 5000 level classes, these generally have a student led research group project within those classes uh, that is often then disseminated at a conference um, after that. And then we also embed research opportunities in our study abroad courses as well. Biology is very, very active in study abroad. Uh, I will say this is a photo from my study abroad class that runs to um, Andros Island in the Bahamas. We focus on human and veterinary medicine and as a part of that help sponsor uh, a free two day spay neuter clinic for the animals on this island. Uh, and so this is my students actually doing research on Andros Island um, with uh, samples that they took during the spay neuter clinic. So in kind of embedding this in all of our courses all the way through. Next slide. All right, um, so 
the next few slides are going to be kind of what this looks like in other disciplines. So I reached out and I said, okay, what does this look like for you? How do you define undergraduate research in your discipline? And I found that there are a lot of similarities across these fields. Um, there's a lot of differences as well. And so, for instance, in health science and health education, um, they're, of course, going to use this as a way to address specific health problems. And so this might be a mini class project project and a research methods class or an independent study that involves research. Um, but in general, they are um, either developing their own study, so developing a primary study, analyzing existing data, or reviewing the existing literature. Um, and then, you know, kind of the general steps that we are familiar with, identifying a problem, collecting data, um, and then analyzing that data. They describe this as being narrower in scope um, than a master's thesis, which I think is a really good description for a lot of our undergraduate research. Next slide. Um, in computer science, they have a lot of faculty led um, mentorship as far as undergraduate research and a lot of different opportunities that students have. So they can take an independent study course. Um, they can take a specific research course. There are projects embedded into their curriculum uh, or they can be what they call a research assistant to a faculty member. Computer science also has a, an undergraduate research certificate in that department, which is 15 hours of coursework that is designed to prepare students for research intensive graduate programs. Uh, so they identified a need for their students to have these skills before they go out for grad school uh, and actually manifested that in a research certificate. Next slide. Uh, and so this is one that, you know, this is me trying to wrap my head around, okay, what does this look like for a diversity of different disciplines? So in art, um, they define this as creation of new knowledge. Uh, and so it has to be creative, novel, systematic, and transferable. Uh, the quote from art was, we continually explore the unknown and in a good art program, this exploration becomes more and more resolved over the four year period of study. Um, some of this is gonna be in the form of critiques. So delving into the work uh, such that new knowledge for the field and for the students is constantly revealed. Next slide. Um, another field, so this would technically be within STEM, so this is similar to what we see in our other STEM fields, um, really a push for things that are disseminated and publishable, um, reaching beyond the standard curriculum, finding connections in other fields. Um, once again, kind of a, a few different ways that students can come to this within this department. So pick a topic, um, find the appropriate data, go through questions to arrive at a result. Um, they can make independent explorations through open-ended questions uh, or engage in scholarly work of mathematical inquiry. We also see these um, sort of research projects embedded into their coursework in mathematics as well. Next slide. All right, so now um, a kind of a, a slightly different perspective, but I'm sure one that we're all involved with uh, or familiar with at least, and this is in honors education. So I have recently um, been involved with an honors faculty fellowship. So this is a two year fellowship here at CSU that faculty have the opportunity uh, to apply for. And in doing this, we have the opportunity to teach in the honors college for two years. So every semester I teach an honors class as part of my standard teaching load. Um, and so I'm kind of figuring out how undergraduate research plays a significant role in honors education. So really one of the cornerstones of honors education. Um, so all honors students have to take at least three credit hours in a thesis or alternative to thesis course in their, I think, starting in their junior year and then culminating in the final presentation defense in their senior year. So we have kind of the thesis, which would be our standard typical thesis, but then we also have the option for students who are involved in the arts, for instance, to do an alternative to thesis, which might be a creation of a creative work. Um, so maybe they write a play or maybe they compose a piece of music um, and then they also bring a scholarly approach to that as well. So they, they also write a paper, but it's less of that, you know, big thesis that we think about. Um, they also have to, leading up to this, complete at least one honors contract. 
Uh, and this is in one of the courses that they're taking as part of their normal curriculum, um, where they basically set aside a project to go above and beyond the requirements of that class. And so these are often a mini research project um, or a you know, research review paper or something like that. So this kind of sets them up to then pursue that research in their senior year. Next slide. Um, we have in our honors college a points system towards earning what they call the honors seal, uh, and they can earn these points in a number of ways. So by completing these honors contracts, uh, presenting at conferences, doing performances that are above what's required for their degree program. Um, we also have a good number of recognition opportunities within the honors college. So every year we award undergraduates um, in several different categories. So within the sciences, humanities, professional studies, social studies, and interdisciplinary research. Um, we also in the Honors College have an outstanding faculty mentor award. And I will say this is one of those things that we do not have at the larger university level. And I have been advocating for, um, for about a year now because I think it's really important that we recognize mentorship because it's such a huge part of what we do as faculty and it's really essential to this high impact practice. Next slide. Um, so we have a lot of different types of work that are completed for both contracts and then the subsequent honors thesis as well. Um, so sometimes they can write a paper or a creative piece. Um, they can work in a lab. They can do experiential learning. We have a lot of students who incorporate this into, for instance, their student teaching. Um, if they are in that last semester where they're in the classroom, I am working with students right now that are designing ways to help them teach in the classroom. Um, and I'll actually give you an example of one of those in just a second. Next slide. So here we go. Um, a couple of examples of how this can work. So this is Shannon. She's a student from a couple of years ago. Um, Shannon was training to be a special education teacher. And in doing that, she identified um, some issues within her classroom, specifically with students that had cognitive delays. And in doing this, she actually, for her final research project, she designed an app called Ableify. Um, and this is focused on literacy-based interventions for special education students that have these sorts of cognitive delays. And so you can see they uh, can choose one of these like tasks and it will walk them through kind of how to accomplish this. So a lot of kind of daily tasks and um, means to acquire those skills. Next slide. Uh, another project, a uh, very community-based project, this is within our history department, Dr. Amanda Reese, um, and her students have been working on this Martin Luther King Jr. outdoor learning trail. So throughout Columbus, we have these markers um, that have been developed by CSU students through a series of interviews with community members, um, really understanding our city's cultural heritage, and then this manifest Manifests in these neat little plaques that you can walk the trail and learn about the history in Columbus. Next slide. And then one more example. Um, this is an ongoing project. So this is actually a draft um, of um, one of our students works. And so he's taking a combination of kind of history and GIS and taking a map of Columbus. He's also created an app. And so you can walk around Columbus with this app pulled up um, and actually click on certain locations and it will pull up historic photos from the Columbus archives. Uh, so really connecting kind of the present to the past. So a lot of diverse um, manifestations of what we would call undergraduate research happening here at CSU. Um, and I think that we, we have a long way to go as far as maybe developing some of the infrastructure that we've seen at these other institutions. And I think that uh, that's actually really exciting for me because I think that we can do that here. Um, so that's all I have. Um, and I think that we're gonna open it up for questions for everybody, right? That's not true, that's not all I have. Uh, I apologize. Um, the dissemination part, I apologize. Um, we, of course, that's a thing that always we want our undergraduate research 
to culminate in. And so we take our students to local, regional, national conferences. These are photos of my students presenting at regional. And then also the one on the bottom is the national microbiology meeting. Um, and this is, I think, a really important opportunity for them for a number of reasons. They develop professional development um, kind of skills, presentation skills, networking skills, but it also lets them see within the broader context, the field in which they've been doing research, which I think is really, really important. Um, some of this idea of dissemination too, I think can be defined a little bit differently. Um, so for instance, within our courses, often we will have what I like to call non-disposable products. And so that's something that is with the aim of dissemination. So take what you have done research on in this class and disseminate it to the community. Um, scientific communication is one of the things that I really, really push in my classes because I think it's really important. And so that may be recording a podcast or um, having a community forum or creating an infographic. Uh, I'm actually teaching a class right now on uh, scientific misinformation and how we combat that. And so they're designing uh, pro-fact, pro-science propaganda uh, to combat misinformation, which is pretty cool. And so I consider that a means of dissemination as well. Um, and then of course we have a really distinctive amount of peer reviewed publications with undergraduate authors, which I think is kind of the, the best representation of the fact that we're doing good work with our students. Um, is that the last slide? Oh, okay, yeah, there we go. Uh, and so lastly, Momentum. So Momentum is our undergraduate research journal. As I said, I've been the faculty mentor for Momentum for a number of years now. Um, it is led by undergraduates. So this is really an undergraduate endeavor. They have an editorial advisory board that is composed entirely of undergraduates. Um, they take submissions both from our institution and from other institutions as well. Um, anything that's an original work um, that appeals to a widely diverse audience. So that could be primary research. It could be comparative analyses, criticisms, interpretations of the literature. Um, even we have a separate section that's for reflective pieces for students who have studied abroad or something like that. Um, and then all of this is reviewed first by that panel of undergraduates and then also by faculty members as well. So it does go through a peer review process and then we put out a publication about once a year. Um, once again, like really important introduction for these students into the peer review process, um, especially for our students who are wanting to go into graduate school and that kind of thing. This is really important to not only allow for a means of dissemination, but also to train them on what um, scientific dissemination looks like within the field and within um, the scientific community as well. I think that's all. <laughs> there we go. Thanks. Well, this has been an extraordinary set of uh, presentations and information. We all have a lot to think about. Do we, we have a few minutes left to take some questions, however. Um, I'm checking the chat box and then, uh, because we only have a few, few minutes here, um, are you able to unmute yourself to speak up? We did a mute all when we first came on. Yes, I... Uh... There you go. Yeah, uh, I'm Alfredo Perez. I'm a faculty at CSU. Uh, I want to add in addition to what Lauren was mentioned. We have been running an RU sponsored by the NSF since 2015. Um, so for us being, as Lauren mentioned, our undergraduate serving institution having a national RU has been quite important for our department of our students. Um, it has been a, a quite rewarding experience. Some of our students have gone from our RU uh, to the Honors College, and then they have done thesis through the Honors College. So it has been kind of like a pipeline for them to do high impact uh, throughout the, the, um, uh, their studies here. What I wanted to share um, in addition to what has been said is, um, I'm putting in the chat right now. This is a survey that is used by the national um, community uh, for RU sites uh, in computer science. This is, a, this is a tool that is used to evaluate um, uh, the undergraduate research experiences over the summer. It has been tested, it has been deployed like around like on 
easily 50, 60 sites throughout the states. And this is maybe something that uh, it can be useful for everybody um, in their own campuses. Um, it's focused like uh, some of the questions are related to computer science, but in general, it's about research, about the, the student's perspective or on the research experiences. So if you are interested in collecting information about how good has been the research experiences of your undergraduate students uh, while they are at, their insti at your institution, you can easily adapt uh, this survey. All the material is available there. This is a, a, a survey that has been sponsored by the NSF. So uh, the instrument is there. Um, um, how to deploy it also, you can create your own survey, so on. Um, the research behind the creation of the survey, as well as um, results from the national, uh, the um, uh, uh, results from the national RU community in computer science with respect to it. So uh, this is something that again, I wanted to share with you because it can be useful. You can adapt it, uh, all the material is there. And, uh, and thank you for all what you are doing on all your campuses. Uh, undergraduate research is something extremely important uh, and, uh, and it's a rewarding experience for everybody. Uh, so uh, thank you, that's what I have to say. Thank you, I appreciate the comments and looking to see if we have any other comments or questions before we wrap up. I have a question, a, a comment. Please go, Rosa. I am so happy to listen to the experience, but most importantly, different uh, settings of academic, not only just a big institution, but small institution. Uh, we do have at South Georgia State College, our school uh, of science, you only have one undergraduate program. We have a young uh, biology graduate program. Now we're gonna have an engineer graduate program. We do have, and I agree with my colleagues that the uh, research is important, but sometimes we can use presentation in the undergraduate research uh, symposium to stimulate and improve communication for the students, especially those that are applying for graduate school or transferring to another institution. I think this is very important. I, I am in the committee, undergraduate research committee. We also do, we call science demonstration. I have a colleague also here, Bernard Madge, so we take our students to boys and girls club and our, our students, for instance, ecology, conservation, biology, they gave the science presentation. One of the science presentation we did was in cooperation with the Georgia Department of Education and the migrant program. So it was very interesting because our students here had opportunity to interact with the students from different backgrounds, Latin America students. So this was very important. Um, another point that I ask is some of us in the, in, in the institution, we are primarily a teaching institution. So, uh, but it's important. I think, you know, I am from another institution that I retired as associate professor in the university. We had graduate students. But the, the point of a small institution is improve communication, is prepare our students to go to graduate school or to move on. And I don't know if it's coincidence or not, our students that gave presentation at the graduate research symposium uh, could get a, could go to medical school, could go to physician assistant school. So we are trying to coordinate with Dr. Holiski, but we have a small group work on that. Our symposium is going to be April 20th. It's going to be virtual, but looking forward in the fall, be face to face. And uh, in last, but not least, what I'm doing now, Tuesday in my ecology class, I am a UGA alumni, so I invited the, uh, uh, the alumni coordinator. She set up a workshop, a Zoom workshop, interacted with my students. 
we have the faculty that uh, do faculty faculty that do research at UDA. We had two faculty. One of them was Amy Rose that does freshwater study, one talking about opportunity for NSF undergraduate research opportunity that he would consider students from other, other colleges and improve diversity. That was, was very good. And in the, the book, somebody said something about the book. Yes, indeed, the textbook, I use a textbook that talks, uh, when I'm talking about, for instance, a successional or water a quality, the textbook reflecting, we have studies embedded in the textbook. And I think that is uh, uh, important also. So we can tackle this issue to improve research in several ways. I agree with a colleague that said about the music, we, we can include this. We have general psychology students present paper in this talk. I am sorry to take so much with, uh, of your time and thank you so much for this opportunity. Rosa, those are actually great comments. And one thing I wanna say is I appreciate you mentioning the idea of tapping into your, your contacts and other, um, other um, institutions here in Georgia because one of the goals we want to accomplish with our implementation faculty is for to, to, to encourage people to, to reach out and make those contacts. You're getting many of them now. Many of you have them from your, um, uh, from, from your alumni uh, uh, relationships, but uh, it's a very good point. So there's a question in the chat that I can address if y'all would like. Um, so about Tower Day, so specifically, were there any changes you made to the formatting to encourage submission of art projects and projects from non-science disciplines? Um, I will say that, so I was appointed in spring of 2019 uh, after the conference, because we have our conference in April, um, and I planned a fantastic conference for spring of 2020. Uh, it's easy for me to say that because it didn't actually happen, uh, but it would have been great. And um, so we, we asked ourselves that question. And part of what we did was expanding kind of what our traditional thought of what a conference looks like. Um, because when, we, when I go to a microbiology conference, we have posters and talks and that's it. Um, and so we said, okay, what else can we do to really highlight the things that are happening across all disciplines? And so when we solicited abstract applications, we asked them to, um, we had a few categories that they could choose. So we had performances, um, we had art exhibition, we had um, demonstrations. So for some of our like teacher education programs and that kind of thing, maybe they could give a demonstration of a cool um, pedagogy technique that they were learning. Um, and then we also had an open box that was like, or tell me here um, what you would like to see so that they can really inform us as to the best way to highlight their work. Um, and so once again, like we're, we're online this year, um, but next year we're aiming for an in-person conference. And so we're really going to take advantage of a diversity of different presentation styles and let them know that that's available to them so that we can really make this a um, super diverse sort of representation of all our scholarly and creative activities across the university. But it's a challenge, I will tell you, it's kind of changing the paradigm as far as what people expect our undergraduate research conference to look like. We've actually had uh, in, in uh, recent times, a faculty, but in addition faculty, some students using Flipgrid, uh, which is a, a, a way of putting together uh, video responses. And the really interesting thing in the Momentum Summit we had recently was asking our faculty to do their reports in Flipgrid as opposed to typing. And we had some fantastic responses. So for example, one of the uh, institutions based their response on Hamilton. So it was a musical. So and I'm just trying to say, think out of the box with this. And I agree with what everyone else is saying here. You can, you can make this interesting in ways folks would never have imagined. Any other questions or comments before we wrap up? I had a question for Brian, if we have enough time. 
We have just a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. So, so one of the things that um, was mentioned was how you all use the textbook adoption process to have faculty indicate that their particular course is an HIP. I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit to that and whether there's any gatekeeping that happens in that process or um, do faculty, are faculty kind of given a definition of what the HIP is and then they just say, yep, it is, and then that goes into banner, so. Yeah, yeah, um, so we actually do have um, some, some resources for our faculty. Uh, they're hidden behind uh, our, our single sign-on, so I can't like just send you the, the web page for it directly. Um, but it is a very clear documentation guide that says what each of the different codes are and what the hours or the contact hours that, that are associated with each of those are with a, a definition and a full on presentation uh, that we put together with our Center for Teaching and Learning Leadership uh, that relates HIPS to, to sort of the lip service aspect of it. Um, and right now, uh, we, we trust our faculty to have engaged with that material, to know what the codes are themselves, and to be able to provide that. We don't do any sort of gatekeeping or like filtering as of yet. However, we are working with um, our Center for Teaching and Learning Leadership to standardize what some of those definitions are and to provide some more instruction for our faculty so that they have a clearer and more uh, stable across the different uh, departments um, understanding and guidance about what the key elements are. And we wanna to put together some uh, template models for them so that they can put that into their syllabi as well. So that when they say that I've got undergraduate research, they can also identify which of the uh, eight key elements are also going to be associated with that in case we do want to do some sort of audit work or we want to be able to sort of highlight some, some work as well. Does that kind of answer the question? That That's perfect, yes, thank you. Um, so is, am I to assume also that that means they do that each section, each semester, so it's not an ongoing that, you know, Dr. Um, Dr. Todd's class and this is always going to be a high impact. It is that, yes. And so um, so the way our system works is that if a faculty, so if Brian Dawson and I teach a quantitative methods, if I identify that as this particular HIP code, that will carry over for me teaching that course in perpetuity. Um, if I want to make changes to it, I can update that on the next time that I, if I increase something or change something. And so we, we filter to check for those. We also allow the departments, if they know that at the, the course or the, uh, the, the course level, so we always have a, a senior capstone course and it's always going to be this, or we have an internship course, it doesn't matter who teaches it, um, they can provide that list. And so we've had some of those things that kind of help take the burden off faculty having to you know, to do it if they change different internship directors, that course will always be quoted, coded as a particular uh, high impact practice, regardless of who teaches it. Great, thank you, thank you. All right, any, um, any final comments or questions for us today? We've had an extraordinarily effective uh, set of presentations and good conversation. Any anything else? I noticed that the uh, uh, that the Leap State Georgia uh, link was shared in the chat. So for all of you who aren't really familiar with Leap State, you know there are partners, our close partners with the USG and all of the SIPs implementation work. So I encourage you to take a look at in the chat at the uh, the link, which is a WordPress document. Um, or you can just, you can contact any of us here uh, because we'll be glad to, to get you in touch with the, the right person at the right time. Yeah, I wanna thank everyone here for uh, what I think has been a, an extremely useful uh, amount of uh, set of time and uh, focus on, uh, uh, on uh, well, really more than one hit uh, because we've talked a good deal here also about uh, study away and study abroad. So um, I'm glad to see that that was a part of the undergraduate research that we discussed today. Um, if you have any further questions or, or folks you want to get in contact with, maybe someone here that you heard talk and you don't remember who it was and you want to find out, um, uh, Robert Todd here, you can always contact me, you know where to find me. Um, and also I'll be following up for everyone who attended today with the link to this video for the, for the uh, presentation. Uh, I'll probably have that up on Monday and I'll get that out to you. Uh, I just wanna say thanks again for making uh, HIPS a 
a, a success and um, a really uh, increasingly a scalable effort here in the state uh, and a tighter, stronger, more powerful initiative. Um, and I uh, just hope you all have a really wonderful weekend. Thank you. Yeah, goodbye. Thanks. Thanks again to all of our presenters. Uh, remember that we'll, we're coming back with service learning on April 9th. I'll send you the, uh, the invitation for that, uh, April 9th from 2.30 to 4, slightly different time. And uh, looking forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.